Okay, guys. Um, so it's going to be a bit fast paced in the beginning because I'm going to skip lots of things, but I'd like to bring the whole reflection about food systems, if you will. Uh, this is a presentation that I updated. Um, uh, I did this presentation in Sweden, uh, Spain, and South Africa as well. And I hope you guys enjoy it. So I'm going to share my screen. So let me just um, thumbs up. Can you see it? Okay, cool. So let's get started. So the first, um, why food is important to me, of course, um, I see it in three ways. Um, first, to me, food is about reconnection. Second, uh, food is a way, the way we produce food, you can move beyond sustainability. I don't like the word sustainability. I think it's a, a very outdated kind of word and we cannot sustain ourselves anymore. It's time to regenerate. And finally, the, the, the third part of the presentation, I'm going to concentrate on entrepreneurship. So I'm gonna concentrate more time on the third part of it. So of course, uh, when it comes to reconnection, uh, in my opinion, as a food, as a small food grower, I'm talking about reconnection to nature. And my Italian friend, uh, he says, uh, the wisdom of pasta, or oh, there is, there is wisdom in pasta. So when it comes to nature, of course, every one of us that do grow, uh, or try to grow your own food, we are connected to the rhythms, uh, of nature and to the soil itself. So, um, I like to call ourselves ecosystem engineers because the way we produce food, uh, in a, not using chemicals or pesticides or fertilizers or anything like that, we are literally creating new ecosystems. Um, this is Stonehenge. I know you guys know the story. Stonehenge was built to some scientists to predict the solstice and the equinoxes so people could uh, plan what, whatever they would plan. And if among you guys are some biodynamic farmer, so then you are connected to an even bigger or even larger uh, system, which is the whole um, solar system. And of course, um, we connect to each other through food. So in every culture on earth, we always connected to food somehow. We gather around food and the study of ecology started by studying, studying the food chain. So who eats who? And of course, images like that, we can all relate to it. So in, again, in every culture, we gather around food. So food is a very important um, um, system or a tool for us to gather and uh, to get to know each other and to have fun and to enjoy. Um, so the second part, as I said, we're gonna move beyond sustainability into regener regenerative practices. And I'm gonna bring you guys a few numbers. And uh, this is the, my, uh, my home country is Brazil. If you go to Brazil and you ask for the national dish, this is the national dish in Brazil. It's called feijoada. Uh, and that it was created by African slaves that would cook the, the less noble parts of the pig, like the ears, the tail, the feet, um, with black beans for a very long time. So that will make the meat very tender. So anywhere you go in Brazil, you can find a dish like this. It's called feijoada. So it's rice, black the, the, the feijoada itself, a sausage, and all the stuff. And every time I invite uh, South African friends to come to my house, they always say, can you cook something Brazilian? And I always cook that. And of course, you have to buy rice. And uh, these pictures I took myself from Wuli. So in this package of rice, you can see that uh, it was a product from India packed in the US and sold in South Africa. Just for you to try and imagine the whole path and, and, and the, the rice follows uh, to reach uh, Woolworth uh, here in South Africa. The next one is even more disturbing, which is this one. The rice is product, product of USA or Argentina. So the truth is we know very little about where our food comes from. So there's a lot of, of problems in, in terms of traceability of food. Um, this is a guy that I like very much, Raj Patel. Uh, we are increasingly disconnected both from uh, the production of food and the joy of eating it. Not gonna read it, not gonna read this as well. I don't know if you watched the documentary Samsara. 
there's a very small part that shows uh, meat factories. There's no, there's no blood, there's no water. But I'm not going to play the video. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, there is no such thing as cheap food. If the food is cheap, someone somewhere is paying the price. Uh, it's, not, it's just not possible to produce food cheaply, in my, in my humble opinion. Um, so every time people see videos like that, with animals like pets and uh, without space to move, they always think, oh, but I eat free range, so there's no problem. So let me tell you a little bit about Brazilian free range. Uh, in Brazil, 99% uh, of our cattle is free range. What does it mean, actually? It means that every head of cattle, I'm talking beef only, will occupy one hectare of area. So what you see here is the Amazonian jungle disappearing uh, because of pasture and soybean. And I don't know if a number comes to your mind, but try and imagine how many heads of beef we have in Brazil. We have 200 million people. And we have 227 million heads of beef in Brazil only. That's 227 million hectares to produce free range beef, which means twice the size of South Africa. So basically two South Africa's, Brazil is nine times South Africa, basically two South Africa's inside Brazil are dedicated to free range cattle. So that's just to give you an idea on how impactful is uh, our, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm not vegan, I'm just um, aware of what I eat. This is an amazing TED talk that you can watch. Uh, Antonio Nobre is a climatologist that uh, basically states that the Amazonian jungle is not the lungs, does not represent the lungs of the planet, but the heart of the planet. It regulates the whole climate in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so let's move into, um, I like Foley very much because he, he brings this um, very, very nice and neat uh, expression. And when we think about threats to environment, we tend to picture cars, smoke stacks, not dinner. But the truth is our need for food poses one of the biggest dangers to the planet. Okay, not going to go into food security, not going to go into sustainable diets. Uh, these are very important numbers. So just in terms of uh, the way we produce food nowadays um, is the leading cause of deforestation, land use change, and biodiversity loss. And it accounts for 70% of all human water use. Uh, this is how our um, um, agribusiness works, basically. Uh, these numbers are a bit old, but they didn't, didn't change very much. So the whole narrative about we must produce more food, I don't like that narrative because uh, we never produced as much food as today. And we never had uh, as much as people that go hungry today at the same time. And this happens at the same time that we waste, this is the global average, something between uh, 30 uh, to 50% of everything that we produce. So just try and imagine the impact that for every 10 apples that you produce, three are gonna go to waste immediately. So it's really huge. And uh, this is, these are numbers from South Africa. Uh, we waste 31% of local food production in South Africa only. And of course, when you look at uh, the food wasted itself, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And you think about the land that was used to produce waste, the energy that was used to produce waste, the water that was used to produce waste. So the food itself that is wasted is just the very tip of the iceberg. Okay, so as I said, these are also uh, very big numbers. Um, if, you, if you could avoid uh, wasting 50% of the food waste in the US, in US only, we would raise 1 billion people from undernutrition. Just half of the food that goes to waste in US only. Uh, this is the equivalent area uh, that is planted in US only to produce waste. Just try and imagine and try and picture that number in your mind. 7 million hectares used to produce waste. So that's what I call farm to compost. It's not farm to fork, you know, like you just, re you just gener generate uh, waste, food wasted. And these are the number of animals that are wasted uh, worldwide uh, per year. 
It's just um, huge and humongous. And I'm going to tell you a very interesting about, a story about um, rice. I did a Buddhist, I'm not Buddhist, but I, I did participate in a Buddhist retreat twice, the silent retreat called the, There's Someone Else Coming In. Michelle. Where is Michelle? Okay. Michelle, admit. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right, so uh, during this uh, retreat that I did participate, um, you couldn't speak. You were not able to communicate or speak. You had to be silent during seven days. And during that time, we used to eat lots of rice. It was a Buddhist uh, monastery in Brazil. And once I, was I did finish my bowl of rice, and there, were, there was about like two or three grains of rice inside that bowl. And the Buddhist monk came to me and pointed to the rice and said, eat. And I thought myself, it's just one or two grains of rice. But at the end of the retreat, she told the whole story. And um, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I did the calculation. So in China only, uh, people eat rice in every meal, basically. Okay, If they have three meals a day, they will eat rice. I'm, go I'm giving the example of China only. So one grain of rice, that's the, the average um, uh, weight of an average grain of rice. If you make it three meals a day, uh, that's uh, the weight of rice that you're wasting. Times a year, that's the amount of rice wasted by, by person if each person would waste one grain of rice per meal. Times 1.2 billion people in China, and that's the amount you have of rice waste if each Chinese would waste one grain of rice per meal. So that gives the scale of, 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 of food wastage um, all over the planet. Okay, so let's start moving uh, into entrepreneurship. This is the last big number that I'm gonna give you guys. Uh, in 2050, we're gonna be probably more than 9 billion people now. Um, Six billion of them li living in cities. And according to Foley, we must double our food production. Because if we follow the current thread of westernizing the diets and food waste, uh, that's not going to be enough just to um, increase it by 30%. Uh, we're going to have to double because we are also changing uh, uh, the uh, things that people eat. We're changing the diet all over the planet. So let's uh, have a look on um, the positive uh, side of it. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of uh, the EAT forum in Sweden. I can send you the link. It's one of the most important forums uh, that gathers scientists from all, all over the planet looking into food specifically. It's really amazing. I can send you the link later. Um, I'm not going to watch this video, but basically food can cross over uh, all the sustainable development, go development goals. All of them are somehow connected to food. So let's go into the last part of this presentation. Uh, this is another am amazing TED talk that I invite you guys to watch. It tells the story of a fish farm in Spain that was completely transformed from a very, very um, traditional conventional fish farm into something that was purely organic and regenerative. And this is a, ca a, a case on the planet where a whole fish farm was completely um, recreated in order to reno uh, basically recreate the whole ecosystem. So watch this TED talk when you have time. We're not going to watch it now. And finally, the last part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about a few examples on um, where we can somehow find the cracks in the food system and bring something better. Um, all, all the processed food on the planet belongs to 10 companies. Wherever you go on the planet, uh, everything that you see on the shelves, it belongs to 10 companies worldwide. So this is an MIT report from 2015 pointing out uh, to two big trends in terms of what's going to happen in the future of food. First, the way we access food. Uh, I'm bringing you this example. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. And also, we are changing the, uh, what we eat. Um, so you guys probably familiar with this type of business 
where basically you choose uh, a meal and that meal comes in a box, right? With every ingredient already in the right amount. So you just unpack and you follow the recipe and you cook it. So that model was born in US called Blue Apron. Uh, we had a South African version that is called You Cook. And you're probably following what's happening now is that uh, OZTF uh, Urban Farm now is connected to You Cook to bring you uh, meals uh, where every ingredient comes from a small producer. So this is unique. Uh, this is something very, very unique happening right here in South Africa. Uh, this is a very big example in the US. Uh, the name of this company, Instacart, uh, valuation of this company nowadays is more than $400, $400 million. They deliver whatever you want from a huge list of producers and grocers. Uh, uh, so you just go through the list and you'd say, okay, I want rice from this guy. I want pumpkin from this guy. I want potatoes from this guy. And they deliver to your door in one hour. So this is a huge, um, I mean, um, innovation in terms of how do we access food. So you're not, this company is now is, uh, uh, is, is going um, skyrocketing in terms of, in terms of value uh, just because of the pandemic that we're facing nowadays. Um, so also we're gonna change the, what we eat. So we're talking about, I've, you probably heard about um, meat that is not exactly meat. Uh, so we have different companies working on that. Um, Beyond Beef uh, is one of the most important ones, and Impossible Burger is another one. So basically, uh, they 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 isolated uh, the enzyme in plants that give uh, the taste of meat in your mouth. So if you if ever the Health Bay market opens again, you can go and find the Impossible the the burger from Beyond Meat selling there. And I tasted myself, I promise you, if, if I don't tell you anything, you're going to say that's me, but that's not me at all. Um, so in 2015, um, the Impossible Cheeseburger was launched. So it was the first company working on uh, meat that is not meat, that is basically uh, a vegetarian meal. And Google tried to buy them for $300 million, and they said no. So nowadays, they made a deal with Burger King. And you can find the impossible water. So there's no, there's no meat included in that meal. It's completely uh, vegetarian. And that company is valued nowadays in 4.8 billion US dollars, just to give you a bit of perspective in terms of uh, scale. So this is from Health Bay Market. Um, you can, I was there last year in August and I tried uh, the Beyond Meat Burger. It's very expensive though. Uh, this burger was 120 uh, rand. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, there's another big trend now is that we're going to eat more insects. Um, I have here in my house the, the flower itself, the cricket flower, and I have a cricket energy bar. So imagine energy bars made of, or of crickets, basically. And um, this is one of the innovations coming in. These are other nice examples. These are more maybe connected to our reality. This is a Brazilian example. This crew, this crew in Brazil, they um, open up um, a very small store where they sell only organic produce for the same price they bought. If they buy from a producer, a head of lettuce for 10 rand, they're gonna sell it for 10 rand. Probably in your mind now, you're thinking, what's the business model? How these guys make money? So this is the queue that happens at 6 a.m. when the produce will arrive. So they are sold out by nine. So again, they buy the produce and they sell for the exact same price they bought from the small producer to the client. So the business model is connected to donation. So just behind the counter here, there's a big uh, chart showing, okay, we, pay, we, we bought this head of lettuce for 10 rand, but to keep us going, if you pay 13, that's gonna help us pay for the rent and the salaries and everything else. So they're, they, they're still working. They still have this huge line on a daily basis and they're still going. So everything is transparent and people love it. Um, this is another big example also from Brazil. This very young lady created a system that um, basically uh, installs uh, small uh, sensors 
on the land, on the soil itself. And these sensors are connected to a computer and that computer is connected to a satellite. So basically, uh, it shows exactly where do you need irrigation and where you do not need irrigation. So this is very, very precise irrigation. Um, and the outcome is that you use 60% less water and energy for irrigation. Uh, this is a very interesting um, business model as well. It's called Imperfect Foods. So these guys specialize in buying veggies that are not beautiful. So they go to the farmers and they buy the veggies that will never go to a market, that will never reach a market. And they buy those veggies for a very small price and they sell it for a very small price. So they have a huge clientele, mostly restaurants, that that are going to make like tomato sauce or um, carrot puree or things like that, that you don't need a beautiful kind of vegetable, vegetable to present. Uh, this was a business that I used to be a shareholder in Brazil. We closed our doors. We launched this idea about 10 years ago. So we were selling snacks, but each one of the snacks was a family recipe and we could trace 100% of all the ingredients. We knew everything that was in the package and the recipe was prepared by a small, uh, small family. And it used to come in a box like that one. So you would sign for the service and a box like that full of uh, very uh, nutritional uh, snacks would come to your house. Our clients were mostly businesses, uh, but then competition came in basically creating the same kind of uh, concept and but lowering the price heavily and uh, we had to uh, unfortunately close our doors this is an amazing model that comes from australia it's called open food network so listen to this one this is one of my favorites so basically how does that work so this is the map of australia so each pin each one of these small pins here is a small producer producing whatever. So what's their model? So let's say I have honey, right? For me to put my pin on the map, it's for free. I pay nothing to the platform. I just go there and put my pin on the map and say, this is Eduardo's honey, that's my price, that's how I produce my honey, whatever, right? So. Uh, in that case, I don't pay any money and the platform doesn't make any money at, at all. But I can use the platform to buy from the producers. So I can access all these producers through the platform itself and I buy from them. Uh, they organize themselves to deliver the produce to me and the platform will keep 1% of all the revenue. Uh, believe me or not, about in 2014, I was an angel investor of the South African version. Never happened. Uh, lots of problems with um, uh, small producers in South Africa. They are not digital. They are not prepared to upload information or do anything like that. So we basically lost um, a big amount of money. Um, this is a South African uh, initiative as well. I don't know if you guys are aware. It's, it's called Kula. Uh, it's also connected to small producers only. Uh, and it, they also sell like, uh, like educational products, uh, like courses where you can grow your own veggies and uh, use different stuff. It's a very interesting uh, example from South Africa. And this comes from Scandinavia. It's called Food Nodes. It's one of the most beautiful uh, examples that I've seen. Uh, so basically when you pay a membership, the donation helps the platform to keep going. And uh, basically they map all the small producers and they gather uh, the small producers in markets um, every week. They call these markets nodes. So small nodes happening everywhere uh, in Scandinavia. Um, we're not going to watch this video. It's about Yvonne Schwinard, founder of Patagonia. In New York, Manhattan, uh, the first residential complex uh, that has an urban farm as part of it was launched in uh, New York. And the head farmer is this little lady here called Zaro Bates. Here in South Africa, in Ottery, there's a new development that was launched, I think, last year. And they also have uh, big spaces for urban farming as part 
of the development as well. Um, this is uh, a very interesting example where you connect uh, urban farming and aquaponics. It's called Grow, Grow Up Farm. So this is their model, basically. You install a container where you have at the top uh, uh, the veggies being produced, and inside the container you have the fish farm. So this is a whole system that is uh, ba that basically occupies an area of one container and can produce a lot of food. This is the South African version, not in a container yet. It's called Future Farms. They specialize in indoor farming. Um, probably you know that uh, indoor farming, they use a very specific type of LED with a pinkish kind of light uh, that is very, uh, that helps uh, the plants to grow uh, faster. This is a Brazilian guy, he's German actually, but um, living in Brazil for more than, more than 50 years. He created a new kind of type of agriculture or farming that is called syntropic farming. So he basically uses agroforestry to recover very degraded areas and create food forests integrated with food production. You probably know this one, the Abalobi platform in South Africa that can connect you to small fishermen. So you open the app and you can buy the fish straight from a small scale fisherman. And the most interesting part for me is that the, the biggest amount of money uh, is paid to the community uh, itself. So the platform keeps very little in terms of what is exactly sold. So when you buy the fish from Abalobi, the fish comes with a QR code. You just read the QR code and you get to know the fishermen that fished that fish the day before or two days before. Another South African example, these guys are aerobotics they created an algorithm that can recognize uh, pests in the crop. So just by filming the crop, they can see which tree is contaminated by a pest. So basically, you, you're going to use pesticide only in that tree, not in the whole farm. Makes a lot of sense. Of course, new farmer's markets uh, happening everywhere. This is Kailicha in Piro Yabantu. Uh, they're struggling a bit, but still going. Um, of course, you know OZCF Farm. I don't know if you are aware of the numbers, but OZCF, uh, they were turning more than a million dollars per year uh, at the waterfront. Just to give you an example of a power of a farmer's market. That's Cheryl Zinski. I've seen, I bet you, you know her. You know her. Uh, she's a friend of mine. That's OZCF. Okay, so I think from my side, this is the conclusion. So in 2050, we're gonna be uh, more than 9 billion, billion people, uh, 6 billion cities. According to this scientist, food production will have to double. Uh, of course, we need to feed the planet within the planetary boundaries. Uh, we have boundaries for that. Food production can be restorative. I think that's the most amazing thing. When I, when I look into things like syntropic agriculture, when I look into things that were done with Veta La Palma fish farm in, in Spain, we can at the same time help to completely restore an ecosystem and produce food at the same time. Um, MIT pointed out to two big trends, uh, the way we access food and what we eat. Uh, the founder of uh, the clothing brand, uh, Patagonia, says that the next revolution is in food. I agree with him. And that my last um, phrase on my master thesis that was about uh, food system. Food is the revolution, re revolution, all caps. And if you didn't watch this, talk, this TED talk, please watch it. Uh, his name is Ron Finley a guy that is basically using public spaces to plant tree gardens and veggie gardens everywhere in the city. Basically, he started in Los Angeles. He became a huge uh, name in terms of um, a revolutionary kind of act of planting food in public areas. And people can gather it for free. And uh, it's an amazing TED Talk. Very, very inspiring. So I call this presentation Food Reloaded. So that's me and my little daughter. And it took me 42 years 
to be able to grow 2% of all the food that I consume, only 2%. Yeah, I still buy 98% of all the food that I consume from other, other people and supermarkets as well. Cool, that was, that was me. I'm gonna close uh, the Zoom. I'm not, sorry, I'm gonna close the presentation, the Prezi, and come back to Zoom. There we are. Maybe open for questions or comments or whatever you want. Please just open your mic and uh, bring it on. Um, I'd like to ask, a, well, your opinion. Um, so can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, you say um, food production can help with environmental restoration, but how do you think that applies to um, climates and environments like ours, like the um, the FAMBOS, which is not a high nutrient system. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of talk on our WhatsApp group and from other people in general saying we should do guerrilla gardening around Cape Town, throw seeds into river systems. And to me, as a, as a botanist, that's an incredibly dangerous um, kind of rumor and, and thing to spread in, in our system. So how do you think food growing could be restorative in the Cape Town context? Very interesting, Michelle. I think in terms of fibers, I don't know how to how to regenerate fibers itself. But in terms of in terms of creating fertile soil, I don't know if you ever visited Abalini Bezekai in Kailicha or other uh, farms like that. And that soil is basically sand, right? And they've been like composting uh, through years and years and years. And the last time that I was there, I promise you, the soil was amazing. And it just takes a very, very long time. So this guy, this guy in Brazil, his name is Ernest. He's regenerating a land that is completely dead uh, into agroforestry uh, systems. But I don't know how to apply that into fimbos. I know that we explore only a little bit of fimbos that are that is edible. We can use lots of uh, fimbos to eat uh, to create different stuff. But I'm not a specialist into fibos. Fibos. I don't know how to make this merge into like food production. Food production that is alien to fibos and fibos itself. Don't know if I answered. I answered with a no. <laughs> I answered yeah, with a don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, quite, I'm quite glad you answered with a no because um, that for me that that that, that is the, the right answer. <laughs> in terms of um, our particular vegetation type, whereas I yeah, but I, but I what I see, I mean, um, maybe not maybe not uh, regenerating fibers itself, but the way I see things, if you have an opportunity to have like a patch of basically sand in the middle of a township and create a whole ecosystem in there, that in my opinion is positive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think, and um, I just think it, it needs to be clarified for a lot of people that in in our in our region, uh, when it comes to growing food and restoring areas, you really need to concentrate on areas that have been degenerated before. So you can't take pristine train boss and turn or 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 an area that could be pristine train boss, change the soil, turn it into a food growing area and then say you're restoring the area because you really aren't, if it had a chance to go back to Fainbos or whatever the indigenous vegetation was. But if the area was absolutely devastated, polluted, concreted over, then, then I think that's the best thing to do is to grow food there rather than Agreed. an area that could have been um, an indigenous area. Okay, We're that's on the all same page. Yeah, cool. Just... I wonder about people's views on things like lawns and um, uh, a typical uh, kind of American style suburban um, landscapes, whether th the best way to restore those is to take them back to Feinbos or to take them to food production or mixture of food production and Feinbos and, and uh, fruit trees, etc. Um, and people know that what Jill is doing, and I'm also increasingly doing with Jill, is 
is we taking an old lawn and we turning it into a mixture of, but not fangles, but uh, various plants growing the soil and then with a view to growing food and becoming, we, we also agree, we'll never be planting rice here and enough potatoes for us to, to eat, but we're definitely going to, to, each year there's going to be a bit more. Um, I just wonder about people's views on, on transforming typical suburban lawns and things into something else. Yeah, I think uh, it comes back, to, my opinion goes back to uh, the point that Michelle brought. I mean, if the area is already like uh, degenerated somehow, I mean, I have a lawn, but I'm happy to replace it uh, with a veggie garden soon. Uh, but, uh, and I have fimbos as well, but fimbos occupies maybe one third of the, one third of, of the whole property. Uh, but I have an area that is big, that is dedicated to a lawn, and that, com that to me is completely useless. Uh, I mean, I could, I could be producing way more food uh, using that lawn uh, instead of just the back garden that I have. Yeah, I suppose that would be my view as well. Within the urban sort of perimeter, um, I think we should really sort of grow as much food as we can. Outside in the wilder areas, those I do think we need to look after and keep as indigenous as possible. Um, but within it, uh, definitely all the resources that go into keeping lawns going, uh, if they could be redirected into food, it would make a massive difference. Mm. And I also just wanted to say uh, thank you for this talk. And uh, um, I found it very interesting, I suppose what you're really saying, the sort of the, the, the overall message I think is that you're you're seeing food getting decentralized, which is quite exciting. Uh, you know, this whole centralization that's happened with big agriculture and supermarkets seems to be uh, crumbling or, or coming apart in some ways and being uh, re, re what, what would you say, kind of reorganized into a more decentralized system. Um, I actually saw, just saw today that one of the spars is, um, closing certain aisles like it closed its stationary aisle and said please rather go to the stationery shop down the road and the same for burgers um so i think that's pretty exciting that that a supermarket would actually voluntarily uh, i suppose realizing that it's part of an ecosystem of a community in a sense uh you know give up certain um markets to to support its neighbors. Uh, and, and that I think is in a way what you're also saying with your talk. Yeah, I think we have lots of, uh, lots of tools that are helping to decentralize the production of food. This guy, Raj Patel, he calls the supermarket the temple of the impossible. You know, uh, where, where you can find any, everything anytime in the year. And that brings a, a whole kind of distorted image of you know, you can produce tomatoes during winter, for instance. Um, so there are tools, there's technology coming in to help to decentralize. And what I'm reading a, a lot about right now is uh, the future of food systems after COVID. And it's very scary, to be very honest. Um, I'm reading a few reports on the World Food Organization and others uh, pointing out to localizing diets, even. So we're going to have to be um, more connected to what is produced locally uh, than to like, you know, shipping um, um, food from all over the planet uh, just because you like it. I mean, uh, so there's a big shift coming in. Um, to be very honest, I cannot foresee the future. I have no idea what, what the world is going to look like after COVID. Um, I'm still teaching my students and I'm very clear about that with them. You know, if you look into me as someone with the answers, forget about it. I'm so sorry. I don't have the answers, but I have, um, I've been reading a lot and I think big changes, big changes are going to come and we must look into, uh, food sovereignty, um, more than food security. Um, so in order to produce our own food, uh, food that is more connected to uh, what we produce, what with our culture and what we're able to produce as well. So I think 
exciting times or interesting times at least. Can you maybe explain the difference between food sovereignty and food security, please? Yeah, so food security is uh, the condition where everyone um, has access to nutrition, nutritional food that is culturally accepted. Um, and when it comes to food sovereignty, you put the element of production in it. So be, you, you're, you're going to be able to produce that food that's going to allow people to access that food. So it's more connected to producing it locally. So you can, you can become uh, independent in a way. So um, that's, that's the main difference between the two concepts. Food security doesn't say, okay, I don't care if the rice comes from China. When it comes to food sovereignty, uh, that, that uh, element comes into play. Where does it come from? Can you, can you be independent in terms of food production or are you going to be dependent into, on, on China for you to have rice? Um, yeah. Um, sorry, that just made me think of something that for us um, is maybe that, I think that's what the Slow Food Network does is um, uh, highlights the food, uh, food sovereignty um, component of food. And actually, Jill, maybe that's something we need to um, investigate if we can become part of, part of that, because I know they have nodes um, as, as how the House Hout Bay Food Growers Network. Um, it, might, it might be an interesting way to expand this project we have going. Very good idea. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I think we, we are more than 30 minutes in, 46 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah. Uh, um, so just wanted to say, Eduardo, thanks very, very much for the talk. I found it, uh, I, I learned a lot and it's a beautiful um, structure, especially the starting off with it's about connecting or reconnecting. For me, that's the center of the centerpiece is reconnecting local communities, but everywhere, not just, not that we don't want to be connected to communities elsewhere, but we want to be connected in a different way. Absolutely. Thank you for, for your time as well. Sorry, I had to rush. Uh, I, I was telling Jill that I, the whole presentation, usually I take like a whole week. And very, one very interesting exercise that I, that I bring to my students anywhere on the planet, and I keep that in mind because I think that's really uh, interesting. When we introduce ourselves, uh, instead of just saying, okay, my name is Eduardo, I come from Brazil, I introduce myself by saying, what's my name? And what would be my last meal on the planet if I had a choice? So, and then we draw that meal right in the middle of a big sheet of paper, uh, like a flip chart, and we draw that meal. And then I start telling them, okay, what do you need to produce that meal? And the ingredients will come in, rice, beans, everyone. What do you need to produce rice? So you have an idea of the impact of uh, your place um, on, you know, uh, in terms of culture, in terms of religion, in terms of uh, what's available for you to eat. And uh, it's a very interesting way for you to introduce yourself by saying your name and what would be your last meal on the planet, I think. Very nice exercise.